This is a revision video for Unit 1, Cold War, PE Topic 1. Okay, so the first thing you need to be aware of are the fundamental differences between the ideas of capitalism and communism. Capitalism, you can see there, focuses on individual rights, whereas communism is the rights of the working class as a whole. Their values in capitalism, individual freedom. In communism, equality. Economic differences are vital. The capitalists believe in free trade. The communists believe in a government planned economy. So that means that the government owns the means of production and then can choose to distribute the profits wherever it thinks they would be best used. And politically these are big differences. Capitalists generally believe in democratic elections, lots of political parties to choose from, whereas within the communist system you pick the communist to rule. It is not democratic, you don't get a choice. Now these ideas separated the USA from the USSR and when the USSR was first created back during the Russian Revolution in 1917 the West including Britain and America supported the side that was anti-communist so there's a long history of Western Europe and America standing up against communism and in the 1930s America and Britain weren't sure whether the Nazis under Hitler or the communists under Stalin were the greatest enemy. And when they united together in the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939, it seemed like their worst nightmares had come true because the communists and the Nazis, who you know, stated openly that they hated each other, had come together. Now, that partnership between the Nazis and the Communists did not last. It was a temporary agreement that suited both of them up to a certain point. And in 1941, Hitler invaded the USSR. What happened next was the creation of the Grand Alliance. And the one thing that brought the Grand Alliance together was the need to defeat Hitler. So you have the USSR, Britain and the USA all coming together to defeat Hitler and their ideological differences, so their communist and capitalist ideas, are put to one side with the main focus being on defeating Hitler. But obviously under the surface those tensions between communism and capitalism were still bubbling away. Now the Grand Alliance main aim was to defeat Hitler and there are three conferences Tehran, Yalta and Potsdam. You are expected to know what was agreed at each one. Now in Tehran in 1943, Churchill, Stalin and Roosevelt are present. And they agreed that there would be spheres of influence. The east side of Europe would be influenced by the Soviets and the West would be influenced by Britain and America, but there would, be, there would be democracy and free elections. So they're carving out these spheres of influence. It's not quite clear what these mean, but fundamentally Stalin wanted to know that he would have an influence over Eastern Europe in an attempt to try and protect the USSR from further invasion. They agreed to open a second front. Stalin and the Soviets have been fighting the Nazis alone and um, this is putting a huge strain on the Soviet Union. So they're going to open up another battlefront so that the Germans have to split their troops. The USSR also agreed that they would declare war on Japan once Germany was defeated. Now, one of the key issues was that Churchill wanted the Second Front to be in the Balkans, which is in Eastern Europe, and he wanted that to try and limit the influence that Stalin and the Soviets had over Eastern Europe because he was scared that it was really an attempt to spread communism. So Churchill and Stalin do not get on particularly well, but Roosevelt and Stalin got on quite well. There was genuine ability to um, cooperate some of that was down to the fact that the Americans needed Soviet promises of help in Asia to fight the Japanese. Now the next meeting is at Yalta in February 1945. This is after
after D-Day, which was launched in June 1944, and they're thinking more specifically how to deal with Germany at the end of the war. So what did they agree? They agreed that Germany would be reduced in size, be demilitarised and would pay reparations. That Germany would be divided after the war, but they didn't put the details on that outline plan. They agreed the Nazi party would be banned and war criminals put on trial and that the UN would be set up. Now it's the same three men attending this conference, Churchill, Stalin and Roosevelt. And yet again, Roosevelt and Stalin get on reasonably well and Churchill is still very wary of Stalin. They also agree that Poland is going to be in the Soviet sphere. Now Poland is seen as a buffer state because it lies between Germany and the USSR. So a lot of decisions were taken about Poland and Stalin was very keen that Poland would, um, would act as like a protection zone for uh, the Soviets. What they disagree about is the meaning of democracy. According to Stalin, democracy is electing the Communist Party because that will best represent the working classes, whereas that is not what Britain and America meant. And there are already issues with Poland and how it was being um, governed. The final meeting takes place in Potsdam, and this is after Hitler has been defeated and the key thing to remember is that just before this conference, the Americans tested the atomic bomb. And that affects the nature of this meeting. The other key difference is that Roosevelt has died and he's been replaced by Truman, who was much more anti-communist. And Churchill has been replaced by Attlee because there's been a general election. Now, they agree to set up the Council of Foreign Ministers to organise the rebuilding of Europe. They ban the Nazi party and they're going to have the trials at Nuremberg, it's an international court. They are going to reduce Germany in size and divide it into four zones. So the USSR, the USA, Great Britain and France will each have a zone and the capital, Berlin, will also be divided even though it's within the USSR's um, larger zone of Germany. And the aim is to reunite those zones as soon as possible. They agree that reparations will be paid. Stalin wants much greater reparations, but they compromise with an exchange of industrial equipment from the Western zones in return for raw materials from the Eastern zones. There is an awful lot of tension over Poland. It is clear by this point that um, it is basically being run by the communists and that you know, really does begin to put strain on the relationship. And there's also tension over Greece because in Greece a civil war has erupted between communists and monarchists, those supporting the monarch, and Great Britain is supporting those monarchists, the anti-communists. So that's clearly um, you know, an open declaration of you know, hatred, lack of support for the communists. So these are the three conferences. You have to know what they agreed and what caused tension. You also need to be aware of what is referred to as the widening gulf between the Allies. So what happens after the war? So first of all, Churchill, no longer Prime Minister, goes to America and gives his famous speech called the Iron Curtain speech. Now remember, it's not a real Iron Curtain, it's a metaphor. Uh, Churchill likened the divide in Europe to an Iron Curtain. Um, the curtain is a symbol of divide and it shows the suspicion that Britain and America held Stalin in. Europe was being split in two. The idea that it was communism versus capitalism was emerging. You then get two telegrams. The long telegram is the one that Truman received from the American ambassador in Moscow. And this said that Stalin was intent on destroying capitalism, there could be no peace between the USSR and the USA, and that the USSR was building up its military power. And his advice was that America should seek to contain communism. Now the Novikov telegram was the one that Stalin received from the Soviet ambassador Novikov um, and he was the Soviet ambassador to the USA. 
and he told Stalin that America wants to dominate the world and that following Roosevelt's death there was no interest in cooperation and that the American public was being prepared for war. So this is the beginnings of a, you know, a, a propaganda drive and the belief that they can no longer cooperate, that communism and capitalism are going to separate and divide them. Now between 1945 and 1947 the satellite states um, are created. So a satellite state is one that on paper is officially independent but really it's controlled by another. And between 1945 and 1947 the USSR stamped its authority on those countries that were in the Soviet sphere of influence. So um, a lot of them were originally had coalition governments that the communists were part of but that soon changed. So what would happen is elections would be fixed, this would result in communist leaders, their, their loyalty to Moscow would be checked, you'd then create an atmosphere of fear and mistrust so the opposition don't unite against the communists, the police and the army ruthlessly stamp out opposition and then you begin to arrange the economies so that they are dependent on the USSR. And America is watching all of this going on, you know, places like Hungary and Poland and uh, Romania and Czechoslovakia. And they can see that the USSR is tightening its grip on Eastern Europe. Okay, in response to these actions by the USSR, you get the Truman Doctrine. Okay, and this is the Americans setting out their beliefs. So they say that the world has a choice between communist tyranny and democratic freedom. That America has a responsibility to fight for liberty wherever it's threatened. And that America will send troops and economic resources to help governments that are threatened by the communists. And essentially communism has to be contained, it cannot be allowed to grow. Now this is really significant because it's suggesting that America, not the UN, has responsibility to protect the world. It's clearly divided the world according to ideology and it suggests there's going to be no further cooperation. Now hand in hand with this goes the Marshall Plan of 1947. So the only way you're going to contain communism is by spending money to rebuild those uh, shattered economies of Europe. The war has destroyed lots of um, European countries, so provide them with money to rebuild as quickly and effectively as possible so that communism does not seem appealing. And the Americans agreed to provide about 13 billion dollars of aid. In response, the Americans do want um, something. They require those countries that take the money to trade freely with the USA, which will then have a positive knock-on effect to the American economy itself. Now, this is clearly going to be a threat to um, Stalin. You know, this money will be appealing. And at the conference where um, the Marshall Plan is discussed and the aid is made public in Paris in 1948, um, the USSR walked out of that conference. Stalin claimed it was the first step in you know, buying influence, in creating perhaps a military alliance that could wage war on the USSR and he said that those countries in Eastern Europe within his sphere of influence could not take that money. And what happens is he creates Cominform, the Communist Information Bureau. Now this is an organisation that should represent all of those communist parties um, in Eastern Europe and bring them under the direction of the USSR. It's a big meeting basically. And the first meeting rejects the Marshall Plan. Now essentially it's a way to control those countries in Eastern Europe. It ensures loyalty. They investigate all the government ministers and those who are not loyal are removed. This is often a violent process and it stamps out opposition. So you can see the, um, the way in which the Grand Alliance is collapsing. Now the first big test between the two allies comes with the um, 
sorry, between the, within the Grand Alliance is the Berlin blockade and the airlift that follows. So this is um, April 1948 and it goes on until May 1949 and Berlin is the flashpoint. So what actually happens there? Why did Stalin blockade Berlin? Well, first of all, the Allies, Britain, France and America, create Bizonia, Trizonia. So they unite their zones into one area, which is essentially operating as one country. Now, this is going against what was agreed in the conferences. They then introduce a new currency because they want to get the um, German economy up and running to get Germany back on its feet. Again, this is something Stalin is not comfortable with. He wants to keep Germany weak. And then they create a German assembly to write a new constitution. So they're trying to create a new country. Well, this new country seems to only include the three zones. You know, what, what is happening with Stalin's zone? So Stalin's angry because he's feeling ignored and Great Britain and the USA seem happy to divide Germany, whereas that was not what was agreed at, um, at the conferences. So what does Stalin do in response? Well, he blockades Western Berlin. Remember, West Berlin is within the eastern quarter of Germany itself. So Stalin shuts down road access, rail access and canal access into West Berlin. He's trying to prove to the Allies that um, a divided Germany won't work, that they won't be able to have a capital in West Berlin and run a separate country. He's also probably quite keen to force them out of West Berlin as well because it is like um, an opportunity to spy behind the Iron Curtain. He is being deliberately provocative but he is not threatening war. So how do America and Great Britain respond? Well, they respond with the airlift. That's when all the planes with all the supplies fly in day and night, you know, three minutes apart with everything they could possibly need. And this sends a very, very strong message to West Berlin, to the Germans, that they will not be abandoned. And, um, their willingness to keep going and going is making Stalin look more aggressive. Whereas America and Great Britain are looking non-aggressive. They've responded in a peaceful way. So what are the long-term consequences then? Well, in April 1949, whilst the um, airlift is still going on, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is created. And this is a formal military alliance. It is defensive, so it's there in case countries who are members feel attacked. But it formally allies America with Western Europe. So if Stalin were to do anything in Europe, then America would be there to support Western Europe. So Stalin has little choice but to back down and the um, longer term consequences of that in September 1949 West Germany is officially created so the Federal Republic of Germany and then a month later the German Democratic Republic East Germany is created and that's the formal divide of Germany that goes against what was agreed at the conferences and um, sort of symbolises that communist capitalist divide in Europe so you can see here, picture top right with the planes coming in. Top left, you can see the four zones of Germany as a whole, and then the red and blue dots where Berlin is. And then you can see the air corridors on the bottom right. Now, going alongside all of this is the development of the arms race. So the conventional armed forces that both the USSR and the USA have are left quite large at the end of the Second World War. Now the atom bomb, we know America had it in 1945. The Soviets have caught up by 1949. The next development is the hydrogen bombs. America developed it first, but then within a few months the USSR also had a hydrogen bomb. 
The Americans then had the B-52 planes to transport nuclear weapons and the um, Soviets developed the Tu-20 Bear. However, the Americans were in a better position. They had